Thank you all for coming to the Ask the Professional Government panel. My name is Carrie Willigan. I'm the Assistant Dean for Career Services in the School of Business. Um, we have a wonderful panel here. They are not here to talk to us. They are here to talk to you. And our moderator for the panel is Sophia Marshall. So she will be um, kind of directing the questions. And, and again, please ask them questions. Um, if I could ask you a favor, please turn off your phone um, and kind of focus on the panel. Um, the panel will last about an hour, and then we'll have time to network afterwards, OK? I'm going to turn it over to Sophia now. Thank you. OK, good morning, everybody. Come on, good morning, everyone. Yes, I like that. Much better. OK, so welcome to the government panel. This particular panel is meant to deliver some insights on various opportunities within the field of government. So I kind of want to let you know up front that we have a mixture today of people that represent government agencies and those that support the federal government. That's why I think it'll be a very, very, very useful panel. Thank you very much, panelists, for being here today. So the first thing I like to do is to just jump right in, and I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce him or herself, and then to give one thing, describe one, give one word that describes your job. Okay, so we'll start with you, Derek. Hello, uh, good morning, and thank you for having me. So Derek Hager, I work for a software company called Splunk. And, uh, but prior to that, I spent six years uh, working for the Navy as a civilian. So I, I went to undergrad, I actually went to undergrad in Pennsylvania, did my master's here at George Mason. But my idea of working for the government was uh, someone up on, on the hill, you know, as a, as a politician. I had no idea the vast amount of opportunities that, uh, that are in the government. So looking forward to you guys hearing from all these other people. And uh, I guess the one word I'll use to describe what I do now on a daily basis is uh, solutions. You know, everything that we try and position is, is a solution to a problem that, that government agencies serve. It's primarily I'm focused on selling software to the government. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, guys. My name is uh, Doug Ralph. I'm a director of contracting. I work for the Army, obviously, right, in uniform. I graduated from George Mason in 2001 uh, from the business school uh, with an undergrad in public administration. Uh, since then, I've obviously been in the Army, but I, my job now is working with Department of the Army civilians uh, regularly. Um, my office has about 65 Department of the Army civilians in it, and we're focused on contracting and the acquisition process. Um, one word that I would use to describe my position or my job is um, also interesting. Uh, because every single day is something different. Every single day we're working on new problem sets. Every single day we're trying to solve issues that are in the national capital region. Um, when it comes to uh, just a real quick history, I guess, um, in the last 18 years since I graduated, um, I've deployed a couple times. Um, I've been a staffer in the Pentagon. Um, I've been director of contracting. And I've worked with civilians all throughout uh, the country um, when it comes to working through problems, uh, Army Futures Command, stuff like that. You may have heard about something like that. Um, if not, uh, more than happy to answer questions for you in a little bit, and uh, we can talk about it then. And you said your word was interesting, right? Interesting. Okay, got it. All right. Good morning. Um, my name is David McClaney. I am with the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. Um, not an alum here at George Mason, but just getting situated now with our career um, services um, from the Federal Reserve and some of the networking opportunities we're trying to explore. Um, I am an alum from Virginia Tech, so bear with me after last night. Um, it could have been any other college in Virginia <laughs> except that one. So um, I've, I've been with the Fed for the past seven going on eight years. Um, I'm actually in the audit department. I'm an audit manager, IT audit manager um, there. I think for for me, um, when it when it comes to a single word, not just for what I do, but really around the Federal Reserve system, um, the the most singular word that I can associate would be misunderstood, um, because we are not a federal agency. Um, there is a component of the federal government that is associated with us, but we are actual 
independent banks um, across 12 districts across the, the country. Um, so I'm interested in hopefully being able to talk more about that during this session. If not, we can talk, uh, have some sidebar conversations afterwards. Um, and I'm also looking forward to getting more engaged with the students through information sessions and, and attending more of the career fairs as well. Great, thank you, Martha. Hi, I'm Martha Gray from Defense Logistics Agency Energy. I am the director of a contracting group of well, up to 93 people, and we actually um, buy and sell utilities. Um, DLA Energy, however, has a much broader mission where we provide all the fuel support to, um, well, worldwide fuel support 24-7 <coughs> for uh, the services and, uh, and a lot of federal government agencies. Um, the one word that I would use to describe my job is mission, whether directly, which is what the petroleum parts of our business do, or indirectly, which is what we do with utilities. We support the mission to serve the warfighter, to serve this nation every day. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Eliana Hanabar, and I work for a Carney and Company. Um, I've been with Carney for seven years now. I graduated from Mason um, with a degree in accounting, and I am a CPA. Um, I currently work at the Department of Agriculture. Um, with Carney, we support um, a lot of agencies, and I had the chance to work at the Department of Treasury, um, Department of Veterans, and right now USDA. Um, one word that would describe my work would be um, support, because one of our goals is to support um, the client uh, right now. We are trying to get them ready to get an opinion, um, an audit opinion, and pretty much anything that they need, we are, we are always there to support and help them and guide them through it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here today. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Scott Hine. I work at the Department of Energy in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, EERE. That's the uh, single largest R&D organization in the world that does research and development on clean energy um, technologies, fuel cells, um, building technologies, vehicle technologies. If anybody has LED bulbs at their house or in their car, all that research comes from us. Energy Star Appliances, all that research comes from us. Uh, advanced battery manufacturing for electric vehicles, all that research comes from us. Um, I am an alum, my wife is an alum, my uh, twin daughters are alums, one actually works here. Um, very pleased to be in involved with the community at George Mason. I'm on the business alumni chapter as well. Uh, I've done a lot of things that I'd like to be able to share and I think that'd be helpful to each of you going forward. I think um, I'm also the um, director of our IT office within EERE and the acting director of our workforce management office. So the one word I would use is um, challenging. I might say there are opportunities, but uh, there's uh, really too much going on at any one day to spend too much time on it. You just have to keep working through it, working through it hard, prioritize, and do the best you can every day. Um, and again, thank you. I look forward to talking to everyone. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I'm Bruce Baldwin. Um, work for the U.S. Department of State. I'm currently a desk officer there in our High Threat Programs Directorate. Uh, what I do is I basically support all of our High Threat Programs overseas, I'm supporting the RSOs, regional security officers, and supporting our securing our embassies and personnel. And I think we have 33 countries overseas um, that are designated as High Threat Post. Um, I work with the Army, uh, AFRICOM, and CENTCOM often and coordinating movements into places like Libya and Yemen, um, or out of Libya and Yemen. Um, to describe what I do, I would say, I'd use an adjective first, adventurous, and then the verb is service, um, because everything we do is to serve either the customer, meaning the foreign service personnel overseas, making sure they're able to complete their mission in a safe manner, or serving your taxpayer interest in trying to fulfill our mission of national security, um, foreign policy and diplomacy, uh, basically expanding our values overseas, or serving people coming here and protecting foreign dignitaries while they're here 
in conducting investigations. Adventurous because we change jobs every two years. Um, I've traveled to several countries, and uh, most recently I was living and working in Algeria. Um, and finally, I'm a two-time graduate here at George Mason. So. Nice. Uh, my name is Kevin Gottlieb. I am a George Mason alum as well. I graduated in 2012. And um, I work for the Government Blockchain Association. So we're a relatively new association. We started in summer of 2017 with um, our founders started a meetup. Two people showed up. And two years later, we have um, thousands of members. And in, we have chapters in 80 countries around the world. And what we do is we... Um, bring government and private sector together to figure out how do we utilize this new technology because um, it, there's a lot of implications for blockchain. Um, there's a lot of use cases. There's a lot of change it's going to bring. And unfortunately, a lot of governments are behind the times with that. And so what we want to do is help governments utilize these new technologies and figure out solutions for the problems they face. So, you know, if I were to use a word to describe what I do, it's varied. Um, Every day is different. We deal with uh, chapters around the world. Um, uh, I, for example, I recently wrote a paper that was given to the president of Cameroon dealing with the revolution they're having there. And um, one of the, you know, the rebels are using a, um, an initial coin offering, an ICO, to try to fund their revolution. So we were asked to write a paper responding to that. So that's just something, you know, just an example. You know, we do a lot of different stuff. I um, was asked yesterday, that I need to start drafting a proposal for um, a project that's doing, they're doing uh, mining in Afghanistan, not cryptocurrency mining, but actual mining, and they want to protect it using the blockchain. So there's a lot of things we do, and every day is different. So every day I just have to be quick on my feet. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. And that was going to like kind of dovetail into the next question that I had, which is a little bit about, tell me about your typical day. So I'll start with Bruce. I know yours is probably anything but typical, but let's talk to us a little bit. All right. I get, I get to start. Um, typical day. My typical day in my current job um, is I come in early in the morning because I've got to support the people overseas. So if I get in at 8 or 9, they're getting off their job. So I'm normally in around 5 o'clock in the morning, and I work until about 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the p.m. Um, but my typical day, I come in, I see what threats are going on around the nation, um, if it has any direct impact on the country that I'm supporting. Um, I'll contact the special agent out there to see if he needs anything from me um, in terms of support. We brief our seniors here to let them know what they need to know in order to start doing, making decisions for mitigation strategies. Um, or I could get called in to our assistant secretary's office and give him a briefing on whatever security issues there may be on a country or have to brief an ambassador that happens to be coming in who wants to know about the security issues in the country or dealing with uh, our army servicemen and women um, and trying to get people in and out of certain countries, which takes a lot of effort and there is a lot of assets and, and, and money involved in, in moving just a small bit of people um, from one country to another country. Um, so that's my typical day here in the States in my current job. Overseas, <laughs> whole different story. Um, you can come into the office with a plan and, and you don't accomplish anything on that plan because it went sideways because, I don't know, someone came to the embassy and decided to shoot at the door. My whole day changes, right? Um, or someone comes to me with a complaint. Their emergency is always my problem, but we have to work through those things. I'm a customer service um, oriented uh, type job. So it's, it's never the same. And, and if I'm doing protection, <laughs> That's, that's its own set of challenges as well, where you see all kind of different things and you meet all kinds of different people. So that's my day in a nutshell for great. what I do. Sounds adventurous and giving lots of service. Okay, great. Scott? Uh, typical day for me, I get in early, not that early. I uh, live in Fairfax, but I work uh, downtown on Independence Avenue. Um, I'm in the building at 7.30 in the morning. I'm there every night until at least 5. That doesn't include doing emails on my phone. I, I, I take the train, the VRE, so I'm checking email when I first get up. I'm checking emails and sending them at 7 or 8 o'clock at night. Uh, because I'm a, a effectively a director of two different offices, a member of the, the 
senior mem uh, leadership team. I'm, I'm basically in meetings, um, I don't know, seven, eight, nine hours a day, running in between meetings one to another to another, uh, trying to respond to emails as best as I can, but it's hard to do that during the day when you're running from one meeting to another. That's why I spend more time on the train doing emails in the morning and in the evening, um, working with customers to help them come up with uh, solutions and identify ways to make their life and job easier or better or to work through different matters, whether it's procurement or personnel or IT or logistics, you know, facilities, uh, badging related matters. Um, again, similar as Bruce mentioned, uh, you could have a brand new intern coming in from George Mason University. They can't get in the building. Um, you know, everything stops to some degree for that and you have to figure that out and it goes all the way to the top and then works its way back down. Um, uh, that's why I mentioned earlier about it being challenging. Um, you know, there's other ways to describe it as well, but there's a, a lot going on every day. Great. Okay. Eliana, so tell us a little bit about support for... Um, okay. So know. every morning, same, getting early. Um, emails is always uh, the first thing I do, trying to see what kind of new uh, requests we have from the client or just um, every day activities that we have to do. Um, as a senior manager, I have 12 people under me, so I have to make sure everybody stays busy and they have <laughs> work to do, review anything before submitting to the client. Um, currently, they're going through a reorganization, so there's a lot of tasks that um, they thought that somebody else was going to do, but if it wasn't transitioned correctly or in time, so we are filling all those gaps and making sure that everything is getting done since the audit is going to start soon. Um, then also there's always support after work and weekends. There's always emails and um, that's part of the support and always keeping track and having always um, good responses and support for them. Perfect. Thanks. Martha? So email is probably the worst part of, of any day, any given day. So I try to do that early and then get it get through whatever blew up overnight and then move on. As the director of a contracting group, um, my job is to get make sure that my folks have what they need. So they are we have um, support through all 50 states. No overseas work for us, although DLA Energy has a lot of overseas work, um, just just not in utilities. Um, so. I always have someone going somewhere. We, you know, we we take training all over the nation as well. So I've always got people on the move, um, and my job really is to help them make sure that they have what they need so that they can do what they need to do. My contracting officers and specialists, meeting with them throughout the day, meeting with my own leadership throughout the day. For the last several months, I've been working with the Navy to bring their business on board for us. Um, I guess that would say that was successful. We kick off with them Thursday, today's Tuesday, um, and then finish the day with whatever email came in while I was doing all the rest of that. Great. Okay. Okay. Um, I think for me, going into leaving from college to to a career, I did not realize how much time you would spend in meetings, and so on a regular basis, it is meeting after meeting after meeting. And in between those meetings, you're checking your email, and then you're running late to your next meeting. Um, so for me, that it's a constant flow of that. And so uh, w what I try to do sometimes is block off time to actually get the work done. A lot of those meetings are brainstorming sessions, uh, discussions on plans for plans. But to actually do the work, you, I, I've learned to just block off time dedicated to doing the things I have to do. And then in between those times as well, you also have the fires, the emergencies that may come up. Um, and so from day to day, I, I, I think that's typical for me. I will add to, for, for me personally, I'm very big on health and wellness. And so um, I have not done it admittedly lately because with winter and, and a lot of things going on at work, but I do block off time around the lunch hour to actually go work out, go for a run. We have a, uh, a, a gym inside our building. Um, and then we have a beautiful island just outside the bank. So I make it a purpose to, if I can, two to three times a week during the lunch break, go out 
exercise uh, really clears my mind. It does come off as a, a luxury, but when you think about it, it really frees you to do a lot of the strenuous work you have to do. So part of my goal is, uh, along with setting time aside to actually get the work done, is taking a break, being able to relax. I, I really have a meeting with myself when I'm out doing some 30-minute, 45-minute workout um, while at work if I can. Great. Real quick, I'm going to jump in. How many of you understand that concept of work-life, work-school balance, I guess I should say? Raise your hand. Good, good, good. I think it's very, very, very important, especially for you doing your classwork and then coming to events like this to learn about things. So I have a question, and I'll come back to you in one second. Go ahead. Same question? Yeah, I think so. And even if you can talk about the work-life balance piece, too. I okay, so um, for me, work-life balance is extremely important. Um, you know, I don't know what you think about the Army or working for the Army as a civilian, but uh, it's extremely important to the Department of the Army that everyone is as healthy and as mentally and emotionally stable as possible. So, you know, for us, um, me personally, I have the freedom to work out whenever I need to, but I usually uh, go for a run just about every morning, um, at least Monday through Friday. On the weekends, not so much. Um, then we have programs in our organization where people go for walks. We have Fitbit challenges. We have a couple different things that, that are mostly internally inspired by the workforce to just try and live a healthier and a more emotionally balanced life, right? Um, you'll see as you get into, um, I think, a professional environment, it becomes challenging because there is a, um, there's the possibility to kind of get in a rut and do the same thing over and over again, kind of like in, in school. You know, you're about halfway through your semester and you're doing the same thing over and over again, right? You have to kind of break out of that. And, and I think you'll find that in at least the Army civilians, we try to um, inspire people to do different things, get out of their office, go for walks, uh, walk up and down the steps. Um, we have push-up challenge, a bunch of different goofy things, right? But all of that's important. And it's not just uh, physical, uh, but also emotional and spiritual, right? For, for whatever that is for you and finding that balance. Because if you're not balanced, you'll never be successful uh, in, in whatever makes you balanced, right? You have to find that. It's very important. Okay, cool. Derek? All right. Well, speaking of uh, work-life balance, uh, I work for a company that provides paternity and maternity leave uh, up to five months for both um, male and female, uh, LGBTQ, you know, the entire gamut of our employees. So I'm exercising my, my work-life balance, and, you know, no pun intended right now. I'm, I'm home with my three-month-old son. So certainly taking advantage of that work-life work balance. Um, it, it is important because in my current career, you know, I do probably work 10 to 12 hours a day when I'm, when I'm not with, with my child. And uh, primarily on that day-to-day that -day basis, I'm a, I'm a project manager. So when you, when you buy our software, uh, you typically have a data challenge and you, you have these disparate IT systems that are all made up of different components and applications. And you need to be able to investigate when those systems go down and you need to be able to secure those systems from cyber threats. So I spend most of my days preparing slides and presenting to customers on, you know, this is why you bought our software. This is when we're going to come on site and deploy it. Uh, these are basically the outcomes that you are going to receive, whether they want to be able to search and report and, and see dashboards using it. So it's really setting customer expectations of um, what we're about to go and deploy. And then I'm on site basically from three to six months uh, with, you know, a lot of the, the names here. Uh, deploying our software and making sure that you know what they what they bought for is is serving their mission. Uh, last thing, last thing I'll say about work life balance is is that you know I, I share a lot of the same sen sentiments as the folks here, related to working out or or finding some hobby because it's really the only kind of uh, respite respite you'll get from from uh, from your work. It, you know it can take you over and it's always in the back of your mind. Great, thank you. So at this time, I want to go ahead and. I did see an, a hand earlier. Any questions? Go ahead. Um, okay, so you guys are basically like talking about how often you work and how much you work. Do you guys have any days off? No. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to take a stab at that? I, I will say real quick. So before, when I was in the government, uh, I was working, you know, mostly in classified programs and in a, a sensitive compartmentalized information facility. So. 
I found that I had a lot better work-life balance. Your perspective's here because I, I couldn't take my work home uh, just because of the, the sensitive nature of it. So there is hope depending on, on what agency and, and you know what work you like and want to support, but maybe some other. So uh, for the Department of the Army, civilians, DOD, most organizations I think are similar, but um, we have uh, a couple different ways of, of working, right? Like we have this thing called flex schedule where you can come in at different times of the day and then leave at different times. So some people like to come in early and then they, they leave early. Other people like to come in late and then they, they leave a little bit later as well. And it's really dependent on the individual. Um, we have these things called uh, regular days off uh, where people work so many hours and then they get every other Friday or every other Monday. Really, it's, it's whatever day they choose off. So over the course of two weeks, you'll only really work nine days, right? So you have a three-day weekend-ish every other weekend. People love that. Um, I get uh, 30 days of leave a month. I can, I can do whatever, right? I go on vacations every year. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're getting ready to go to Disney uh, at the end of May. Um, with my four kids, right? So my days of snorkeling and jumping on airplanes and surfing are dead. But, right, uh, I get to watch my kids do those things and they seem to enjoy it very much. Uh, government civilians also, they get different times off depending on how long you've been in the system. Uh, when you're new, you don't get as much time off as some of the people that have been around a little bit longer. Um, but we also offer telework, which is a thing where you kind of get to work from home, which is really nice for people, especially in this area because traffic's so bad. Um, and with telework, uh, you still have to work, right? You're just kind of doing it from home or wherever you have a Wi-Fi connection. So some people at Starbucks or the beach, uh, I'm pretty sure. Um, but that's kind of government. And can I say, I'm, I'm hoping we're not scaring you as yeah, if we're sounding right. like we're working all the time. So I, I would equate it to, to what you're doing as students. So there are going to be weekends or there should be weekends where you have projects and assignments. So, yes, there are weekends where... We may not have to go into the office, but there are things that we'll have to do at home, um, work-related, to just get things done, meet a certain deliverable. Um, there, there'll be some late nights. There'll be some early mornings. But, again, I really equate that, similar to what's going on with you guys as students, um, especially those who may be student athletes um, or also working students. So between work and school and studying and projects, things of that nature. I think the, the hours associated with it are relatively similar. Um, of course, I think we all have our, our break sessions. Um, my wife and I will take, now we do two vacations, one for us and then one as a family um, with our two and a half year old son. Um, and, I, and I also make it a point when I go home, because my son is at two years old, they don't care about anything that happened at work. I make it a point to focus solely on him and the family. It's no work associated with it. I don't want to be the type of parent where I'm just on the computer nonstop working. So you do have to make that a conscious effort to, to really separate work from just being able to relax. At the end of the day, there's always going to be work that needs to be done. You're never caught up. Um, so you kind of have to keep that in mind as well. And I'll talk for me and Scott um, in terms of how you get time off. So in the federal government, you automatically come in and you get four hours of leave every two weeks um, until you hit a certain, was it five years, three years? Three. So then three years, you go up to six hours every pay period. I'm currently earning, am I? Yep, I'm still in the six hour until you get to 15 years, and then you get eight hours. Yep, so I'm almost to eight hours. I have one more year left and I'll have my eight hours of pay period and I'll really be on the up and up on terms of leave. Um, but for me, since I'm in the foreign service, when we go overseas, we have a higher cap of leave while overseas. So I currently have about 45 days ish a year. And if I earn anything over that, I basically have to take it or I lose it. So I don't mind taking a couple weeks here, a couple weeks there. Um, the only difference between a uh, regular civilian and or just most government employees and someone like me who's a special agent, I'm always on call. So, and that's why we get law enforcement availability pay because I'm always supposed to be available to work or respond 24 hours a day. Um, my current job, not so much, but overseas when I'm basically the sheriff or the 911, oh, if something happens, I'm the one getting the phone call and I need to react. So that's pretty much how it works. All right. Kevin, want to answer the same question? 
Um, yeah, so I'm in a little bit of a different environment because we are a small startup, um, and we grew very fast. We went from, as I said, a couple people to thousands. Um, and with the startup environment, you have a lot of stuff that needs to be done. So the founder and the executive director, um, Gerard Dache, he's a graduate of GMU, actually. He you know, pulls crazy hours, so he's working you know, 80, 100-hour weeks regularly. Um, and you know, he'll stay in the office till like 2 a.m. working. Um, <clears throat> a lot of that is just because he, we have an international, it's an international organization, so we have people from all over the world, um, and we're just trying to you know, keep this thing running. Um, so it can be hard as someone who works for him to leave and go home because I know that he's going to kind of keep working. Um, so you just kind of have to figure out like where are your limits, and um, for me, just uh, like setting those boundaries, um, and even on you know days or weeks where I have to work a lot, just kind of like coordinating with my wife, and because we're you know the office is so close to us, um, we're actually right down the road. Um, sometimes she'll come visit me for lunch, so stuff like that. You just kind of learn how to um, figure out what works for you and for your family. Great, and I think Martha, you wanted to say something. So. Like the Army, we have all kinds of flexible work schedules. There are certain parts of DLA Energy that are 24-7 operations, and so you may, have to be, you may have to take turns covering for certain things or be on call for certain things. But for my particular group, we've had 29 babies plus three more coming in the last four years, so I'm pretty sure my folks have figured out what to do with their downtime. <laughs> so... <laughs> We have um, we practice a lot of work life balance so that you know we have everybody has daycare everybody has you know certain certain things or they're getting married or uh, something like that so um, we also have physical fitness leave that you can have three days a week to you know work out um, DLA has all kinds of great programs for stuff like that so I, I think we do a pretty good job of, of managing a work life balance. Great. Okay. So I want to see any other questions from the audience. Yes, go ahead. So I just want to know how important it is to have an office here with the corporation or company, um, and specifically what your office is doing. And um, did you find going back to school to complete your master's or to get it all done in one year? Good question. Uh, I'll I'll take part of that from my own experiences as well as with my um, three children that have already graduated from college as well. Again, twin daughters from here. My son went to Christopher Newport University. Um, from a federal government, federal employee standpoint, um, it's I think you know advanced degrees. It's always helpful. Uh, I'm not going to not say that. I have a master's in engineering uh, in addition to my undergraduate um, degree. But if you come in as an entry level, you know, GS5, GS7, lower grades, that, that might not mean much to you. But if you, you could go to OPM, Office Personnel Management .gov, and it kind of walks you through that. Lower grades is not as critically important. We're going through a big hiring surge right now. Folks could take a look at that within uh, EERE, uh, where we're going to be hiring uh, 80 folks or so in the next five or six months. A lot of them I was working, uh, teleworking from home earlier today. Um, Log on at 7. I'm on actually two hours of annual leave right now so to come up here because this is something I'm doing for myself and not for the Department of Energy. But I was working on position descriptions for general engineers and physical scientists that then will be announced. So I, it's not as important um, at that level. But what I was told years ago, I, um, when I graduated from here, I, I left. Uh, I graduated in 85, went immediately into the Army. I thought I'd make the Army a career, but it wasn't what I wanted. I grew up in a Navy family, and it, being a dependent and then becoming active duty was different. So uh, shortly thereafter, and I had my top suit secret clearance, and I was a GS-11, and 11 to a 12 to a 13, which are more lower, mid-level, a journey person is called a 13. A master's was not that important, but when I started competing for 14, and then what I was told for a 15, um, I'm currently a, a senior executive, uh, I was told, Scott, you're never going to be competitive for a GS-15 if you do not have a master's degree, and I've actually provided that, um, that feedback to folks that have worked for me over the years, and then in terms of my own uh, children, I know my son had an opportunity at CNU for a five-year program. His uh, undergrad was um, um, software engineering. He could get an undergrad and grad, but he did not want to go to school for five years, even though mom and dad were willing to, to pay for that, and he wound up getting a great job anyway. My daughter 
who works for the FBI. Uh, she graduated from here with undergrad in business and was working at Fairfax County Police Department, uh, picked up her master's in criminology, and now she works for the FBI, and it was really important for her to have her master's there. So it's a little bit different, but purely from a federal standpoint, entry level, not as important early on, but it will help you clearly as you advance through your career. Anyone else want to answer? Yeah, that? so um, if I was going back and doing this all over again, <clears throat> I wouldn't go right into a master's program because from what I've seen from working with the, the government, Department of Army, whoever, right, the, the most important part is kind of getting into the system and gaining experience, right? So if you graduate, which I'm sure you all are close, right, the, the idea of going right into a master's program is probably daunting. Um, but with what I've seen um, in my own organization is getting in is the hardest part, right? And to get in, you need a kind of a, an undergraduate degree just to, to be competitive, even at the lower grades. And uh, what I've seen is most of my employees um, that are moving through the ranks are getting their master's degrees at nights or weekends, right? They're taking their time and doing that. Um, but from, from what I've seen, uh, at least through the, you know, getting in at a seven or an entry level position, you can move all the way through to the junior, uh, senior ranks uh, without a master's degree. Um, you know, like Mr. I was saying, but, you know, when you become a little bit more senior and executive, that master's degree becomes more important. And the more you plan on moving around, the more important it becomes because um, you'll see once you get into the career fields, almost everybody has a master's degree. Um, a lot of people have two, so get into the system, start gaining experience and learning how the process works, and then you can work on that master's, if I had to do it over again. Yeah, and maybe get them to pay for it, because I know the Army offers everyone to pay, you know, yes. degrees. And to be, piggyback off of that, so I, I got my master's from VCU in information systems. I waited until I was at the Federal Reserve, and they offered a very generous reimbursement package. I think for master's degree for us, I think it's either twelve to 15,000 reimbursement per year. Um, and so it could essentially be paid for um, once you begin employment. So something to consider as well from that financial perspective. And then for me, so when I went back to school, I was out for about five or six years. Um, going back and then getting my master's, it really helped me to apply what, I, what I've learned on the job with what I was doing in the classroom. And so it just made that process a lot easier for me versus some of the students that I had, some of my classmates at the time who were going straight from undergrad to grad school. Um, now, I will say it probably is on a case-by-case -case basis depending on the organization or, or things of that nature or department, um, and, and as well as the industry, whatever your major may be. But I know for us, um, especially if, it, if it's students um, coming into like an entry-level position, associate level position, I know for us, we're not looking for that master's degree um, experience, but really just knowing what you learned um, in undergrad, and then we can help you to get that master's and help finance that. And I'll just add one thing to that whole department by department item. Um, with the State Department and the Foreign Service, at least, a lot of people have master's, a lot of people just have bachelor's, but technically to be a Foreign Service officer, you don't even need a degree. Um, so it doesn't mean that you're going to make it in without a degree, but that's the technicality of a foreign service officer. Um, I have my master's. I did it straight af after my undergrad because I wouldn't have come back to school. Um, but I was also working with the Pentagon while I was um, getting my master's. Um, I would don't discount experience. Um, a lot of a lot of careers, especially mine, um, it's very hard to come in just straight out of college, like super hard. Um, you need to display some kind of experience, whether that's through internships or a couple of years of work out in the, whether it's, you know, with one of these other agencies or in the private sector. Um, and then an example of my father who worked 28 years in the government, he only had his bachelor's and, I mean, he was up in GS-15, um, turned down SES only because I was playing baseball, so he stayed put for me. Um, family work-life balance there. Um, so he didn't quite need the master's to move up, but at the same time, it's not going to hurt you. Um, and it also gives you an extra pay um, when you start. So 
over just having a mass uh, a bachelor's undergraduate degree. So I just to say um, to bring in a little bit about the conversation here. What you're basically talking about is being competitive, right? How to make yourself competitive within the field. And a big thing that I've noticed through looking through all of your bios, a few of you, um, certifications. So how important is a certification versus an extra degree? Is that something that our students should pursue? What do you think about them? I'll go ahead and go first on that one. Um, I would say a certification is super important if you are targeting an industry. So when I started, I was a contract specialist. If I was in the private sector and I had certain certifications in contracting and trying to become a contract specialist, that would have helped me immensely. Um, likewise, after receiving my certifications in contracting, I always knew when I joined the State Department, I could come back to contracting because I had certifications, I had experience. So that's very, very, very important, especially in the IT world as well. So with the programming, the C++, and all those different things. So the only thing I'll speak for is Department of the Army contracting. And if you decide to go to the Army and become a contracting specialist, uh, we will provide those certification opportunities for you. So don't feel like you need to get the certifications beforehand. Um, get involved in an internship and entry-level position, and then you will ha we will pay for those classes for you um, to help you along the process. I was going to talk about, for accounting specific, um, we are big in obtaining your CPA, and uh, Carney... Um, is actually developing a program so he, they can actually have sessions um, so they can help you pass all the parts. There's four parts to it. Uh, so we are big in getting to your certification. Um, between but, uh, a master's and a certification, it depends where you're trying to go. Um, for our company, even though we're a CPA firm, we have people that are not CPAs and are senior managers or principals because they do a different part of... Um, our business like project management, but on that side, they also have different certifications like PMPs or other, um, I'm not sure what they do, but, <laughs> um, but personally CPA or even um, for government, CGFM, um, those are very important for us and Carney and I think most of companies, they will encourage you to get them and pay for them. Yeah, so I'm in a unique situation where we offer certifications so that's something that we do a lot, and we've seen a lot of value in offering people certifications, especially on something like blockchain, which most people don't know about. We do foundations courses. We do. Um, we have a whole bunch of tiers for um, people to learn, whether they're government contractors, people in government. Um, that's something we've seen that's really valuable, especially um, overseas. I was just got off the phone yesterday with our chapter lead in Nigeria, and she was talking about there's a huge demand for certification in blockchain, so we're offering that. In Nigeria, um, we're expanding our offerings there um, in Europe. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of value in that. And we've seen people who've been really excited about that. And then kind of touching on the previous question about a uh, master's degree, um, I actually do have a master's degree, and it's, uh, it's a master's in theology. So it dovetails perfectly with blockchain. I mean, just couldn't get a better fit. Uh, but I will say this about a master's degree. One of the benefits of it is it teaches you how to think critically. And uh, a good master's program will expose you to, to different sources and will expose you to different ideas and force you to wrestle with stuff. And I'm a big soft skills person. I believe soft skills can get you a long way in any field, whether it's government, private sector. Um, so looking at master's degree, you can gain a lot by learning those critical thinking skills, the reading and writing skills. So that's what I'd say. Great. Okay. So a question. Go Just sure. one, one real quick thing. Uh, with government contracting, one of the things that we do look for, though, is 24 business credits or hours of, of business. So economics, statistics, calculus. Uh, so you have to have at least 24 hours of, of that kind of uh, background uh, to get into the business side of the government. Perfect. Okay. So a question that I think all of you might be wondering, I'm just going to go ahead and ask it. What types of opportunities do you have available? Um, part-time, full-time opportunities, things that our students might be interested in looking at. I'll speak to that first. Um, so our internship program, um, we, we tend to bring in around 50 to 60 interns every summer. Um, now, the majority of those uh, 
positions are posted around the fall time frame uh, from September through maybe December or so. We could have a few that will trickle down um, in January or February, but we try to have those finalized by around March or so. Um, it's lo the majority of them are located in the Richmond, Virginia area. They are, of course, paid internships. Um, it's a, it really runs the gamut as far as the areas from uh, IT security to human resources to corporate communications um, so it, to econ. So it really is a wide range. I know uh, for us, so in my audit department, we tend to bring in around three um, interns every year um, for the IT side, the accounting side. And then we have a, uh, a data analytics group, audit solutions and innovations group. So there is a, a, a business analytics component to what we do as well. Um, from a full-time uh, permanent position, we have, we're very big in what's called the technology development program. So anyone who is focused in any realm of IT. Um, and what we do is we bring folks in on a rotational basis and they'll work in various areas in our IT um, department. Um, on, I want to say it's around six month rotation for around two to three years. And then at the end of that program, uh, working with their manager, they'll determine well, where may be the best fit for them um, coming out of that uh, to permanently place them. Uh, we also have a number of associate level and entry level positions, whether it's in our research and economics group, um, again, human resources group, things of that nature. So it's a wide range out there. Um, I do encourage folks too. So we are the Richmond Bank. Um, again, there are 12 reserve banks and we all function independently. So if you're interested, you can go from Richmond to as far west as San Francisco to Dallas, New York, Chicago, Minneapolis. Um, so feel free to, to look on our website, check us out. We have some positions that are posted now and uh, our internships will come out again this fall. So we um, are offering internships as well at our organization. And uh, the great news is you don't have to know anything about like coding or anything like that. Um, we don't do any of the like coding or anything at our organization. We're just looking for people who are interested in this technology. We'll teach you everything you need to know about blockchain. Uh, but you get to interact with people around the world. Uh, we're very flexible. If you have ideas, we'd love to hear them. We'd love to let you be creative in your role. Um, there's a lot of um, writing opportunities, a lot of, um, we have an events management position. Um, and it's a great way you get to interact with thought leaders around the world who are trying to figure out what to do with blockchain. And um, so it's a great opportunity. And the great news is our office is literally right down the road. If you go up north on 123, take a left on Main Street, we're right next to Truro Church. So it's very close. You could even walk there. Um, and so our office is right there. If you're interested, let me know. I'd be happy to get you more information. And uh, we're, we've got open positions right now. So if you want to start next week, we could get you started. It is paid. So um, another perk. And uh, we have a Keurig machine. So if you like coffee, we'll even give you free coffee. It's, it's, it's a sacrifice on our part, but you know it's one we're willing to make for you guys. So DLA has several in several different intern programs. One is called the PACER program. It's a three-year internship, two years, which is pretty much um, on-the-job training to get those certifications. You come out level two certified in contracting, and then a year as like uh, working up to a more of a journeyman level. Um, then we also have a pathways program, which is for students that are work usually working on their master's degrees. And we will help you finish school. Um, and then you will enter the PACER program. And then we also have direct hire, which is one of my absolute favorites, where we've actually, for my group alone, I've hired 10 students from George Mason in the last two years, and they come right into the PACER program. So there, it's a starts, the, all of them start at, generally as GS7s, and it's a 7, 9, 11, 12 position. So provided that um, you're performing, of course, that, you know, these are, you don't have to compete for promotions until you get ready to go to the 13 level. And they are really terrific programs. Uh, so uh, exactly the same, right? Most of the federal government works in a very similar fashion. The one thing I would tell you is that um, if you're getting ready to graduate this year, you, you need to be on the hustle right now, right? Because um, the way uh, the government works except for direct hiring authority and some of these pathways programs is through a system called USA jobs, right? You need to understand that process and you need to start looking at it now because there's dozens of jobs, depending on uh, what you're interested in, what you want to do for the government or for the army or the DOD. Um, 
and communicate with people, right? That, that's why we're here. We know how hard it is to break into the process and we see the struggle that people go through and we just wanna help, uh, I'm assuming, right? It, we just wanna help you. So if you have questions about how to break through, ask us uh, and do your research because it's it takes time and the government doesn't work on a college uh, schedule. So in May, when you all graduate, we can't hire everybody at the same time. We're hiring people throughout the year. So uh, it takes time. Those last two things were super important. Um, the pathways internship and the direct, um, that's how I got in, in the government. Uh, someone from WHS, Washington Headquarters Services, was here at a career fair, and she's like, hey, I took up two hours of your time. Here's your job. And that's pretty much how I started. Um, so it was pretty awesome. But the USA jobs thing, uh, it's very, very important when you, and I would definitely welcome you all to talk to us about that because we can talk for days about it. But just to give you a quick one minute, read the instructions. <laughs> if you don't read the instructions and you miss something, you're automatically disqualified, like you're done. Don't even think about it. So the other part is it's gonna ask you questions. Why are you qualified? You have to show like and in business, everyone's like, here's your one page, your two page resume, not on USA jobs. Okay. Define everything and relate it, how it meets the, the abilities and what they're looking for, for that job. And as much detail as you can, because that's, what's going to get you to the next level of, okay, this person's actually qualified. Now, do we want to look at it and say, do, are you ready for an interview? So if you don't do that, you're never going to go anywhere in USA Jobs. And we can probably talk to you more about that in person. Um, the last one for internships, all the things are the same with the State Department, but we have something called virtual inter internships where you can be working from the couch of your home and doing an internship with us, whether it's you're supporting an embassy overseas or you're supporting some headquarters office here in D.C. Um, so just go to our site set up email alerts so you're always alerted on what's going on. Great, that's a really neat thing. Um, quick thing for Carney, we all also offer internships. Um, I think they, uh, we start in the fall and they start in May the next year. Um, we have some of the interns worked really uh, directly with our clients or at the office doing internal work. Um, we also offer full-time positions after the internship. And in some cases, we have students that are not done with school, still go to school and then work with us part-time. And then, you know, hopefully at the end of when you graduate, you stay with us full-time. Okay. Oh, sorry, one more thing is, uh, was mentioned earlier, much of this type of session today, because there will be follow-on questions, is about networking and creating an infrastructure to help you throughout your career. Um, I'm sure like, all of us here, but I'll, I'll certainly speak for myself on this one. I'm on LinkedIn. You can connect with me. You can message me. I've done this for years. Folks have actually had sent me the resume to look at, want to know how to navigate USA Jobs. Uh, I offer myself to you to help put you in a better position, whatever position is you're, you're looking for. Uh, so please feel free to connect with me, and then we can talk going forward. And Derek. Yeah, I'll uh, share the same sentiment as well. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about Splunk or uh, my pathway out of the government into the private sector. Um, direct hire authority, and I think it was ladder program at my agency was a, was a huge plus. You have kind of a clear defined path to a career, uh, which a lot of companies I don't think provide nowadays. Um, so that was just, it, it was really rewarding to know that, hey, if I do X, Y, and Z, I'm gonna be promoted. And that's very rare nowadays to have that. So um, love that. And um, opportunities at Splunk. So being a software company, somewhat technical, a lot of the internship opportunities, they're probably going to want to see a computer science degree uh, or a pathway to some sort of technical degree. We have some internship opportunities in sales as well, uh, mostly outbound calls and uh, inside sales support. So. Uh, I will say um, sales can be very, very rewarding, you know, but it's, it's, uh, it's not for everybody. And uh, there's a lot of risk. You know, we, we had six or seven people make over a million dollars in sales uh, with, you know, bachelor's degrees and, and that sort of thing. However, you know, we also had probably 50% of the people who missed their number and, you know, will, will not be with the company for longer than another year if they, if they don't start selling that. 
I'm not in direct sales. I'm, I'm in sales support and, and project delivery. So if someone sells something and then I go and deliver it. Um, but so just, just think about that and when you're thinking about kind of what you guys want to do. Great. Okay. So I can take one more student question. All right. So um, most jobs with the federal government require security clearance. And you can Google um, adjudicative, um, adjudicative categories for your security clearance, and it's going to pop up for you. Judgment is one of those. So if you're out there partying it up, I partied it up in college. I'm not going to – don't get me wrong. But when you're posting on Facebook – and you're drunk, you're passed out, you've got three beers to the face, whatever the case is, I'm looking at your Facebook account. I'm looking at your whatever accounts before you're coming on, and that's what these background investigators do. And we see that stuff, and then we can say, okay, does this person have good judgment? Yes, no, can that be mitigated? Um, drugs? Depends on where you're trying to work. If you're trying to become a special agent and you've, you know, sniff some cocaine, done some meth, those kind of things, you're probably not going to get the job. If you've smoked a little bit of marijuana, it depends on how recently. Or if you smoke marijuana every time you're stressed out, i.e. before exams, well, you're not going to be a special agent either because it's a stressful job and you're going to be smoking marijuana, right? So it depends on what you did, the recency of what you did, the type of thing that you did, um, that is basically taken all into this one, we look at these factors and say yes or no. So um, just might be mindful of what you're posting online and those kind of items. Yeah, and I think just uh, maybe a follow-on, and let's say things were clean and you get the job and it requires a clearance. I, I had my top secret clearance when I went into the Army. I had it up until a year ago, over 30 years. I no longer work on classified material, but uh, when I worked for Department of Defense, uh, I was drug tested every month, uh, randomly, every month, and folks, if they had issues, uh, we were accepted service, which we don't need to get into all that, but that basically means you could be removed immediately. You don't go through the normal merit protection review type board process. Um, one other thing just to keep in mind that I know we've kicked people out, either they weren't able to come in or they were in and, and not able to keep their clearance, is um, credit card debt. If they had a lot of debt, they'd be out the door because then you have the possibility of selling uh, classified material to try to pay off debt. I th that was going to be mine. Mind your finances. It, I cannot stress enough how critical it is that you keep track of your money and be smart with it. And the other thing is don't lie on the security questionnaire. Whatever it is, if it asks you if you've ever been arrested and you've been arrested, call it out. Even if it was something stupid, you were down at Mardi Gras and you got busted for public intoxication, call it out. Some of the, a lot of that stuff can be mitigated, but not if you don't tell the truth about it. If you've had a DUI, say you've had a DUI. It's not that it can't be overcome, but if you don't tell the truth, you can't get past it. Yeah, well, uh being in, in, in your shoes and, and maybe maybe not everyone's shoes, but f speaking candidly, uh, I came in as a direct hire after undergrad, had to go through the security clearance process. I had an underage drinking in college. Uh, a lot of us drink. I was underage and I was at a party and I was honest and I was forthcoming and, you know, clearly they can mitigate those things. But if you lie, your entire character is questioned and then I think the last thing is, is debt and, and foreign contacts as well. Those are kind of the, the really big ones. Whereas if you made a mistake and you're honest, you know, I think we're all human. You know, at least, at least that's what I'm going to say to justify it. The only thing I would add is just don't, don't assume yourself out, right? If, if you have some things going on, right, ask questions to the people that do this, and we're here to help you with that because everyone has their own unique circumstances, and I know things make you nervous uh, when you're trying to figure it out, right? So don't. Just 
self-select yourself out until you ask some questions. That's the only thing I have. I don't know. I think my example, there was a uh, young lady in uh, college who had a boyfriend who took her credit card, had a lot of debt. She filed for bankruptcy. Um, we were trying to mitigate that, and then our security, headquarters security officers asked me to ask this young lady if she was still going out with the guy, and she was, and they said, no, we're not going to give her a clearance. So just in a real-world example, that's more of the personal debt, not necessarily family debt. And it wasn't even her own, but the credit card was in her name. And the only thing else that I would add is not all government positions need a security clearance or top secret clearance, right? And you're talking to a bunch of directors here, so we're – all the senior folks, and we've done this for a while, but a lot of the newer positions and some of the other jobs don't necessarily require that. It just depends on what you're getting into. Great. Thank you. So last piece of advice, real quick, I want you to give our students um, one thing, one piece of advice that you wish you knew when you were going through college. We'll start with Jay. Uh, I don't know if this is something I wish. Well, I, I think really just have an open mind about work or industries or positions, you know, I left the government, I don't have a technical degree, and now, um, you know, I work for a company where uh, I'm solving technical challenges and, and talking in an IT language that I could never even imagine. So just always have an open mindset that uh, you can continue to learn and relearn things and, and don't think that because you're not strong in math or something else that you can't overcome those challenges. So. Don't ever sell yourself short, and, 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 you know, there's always a reason not to do something. Uh, so just always have that kind of growth mindset. Um, for me, I would say uh, the one thing that I didn't do and I wish I'd have done more of is communicate with people that were willing to help, right? Because when, when I was you all, I was knuckle dragger. I was, you know, blockhead. I'm going to do it all myself. I'm going to figure it out, right? I can do this. And I did, and it was exceptionally painful. And I didn't realize how many people are willing to help. And I didn't take advantage of the people that were out there looking to help, right? You have a team full of people up here wanting to help you. Um, so if I could do it all over again, and one thing I would say is, is reach out to the people that have gone through it because we're not just here for any reason but to try and help you. Um, one thing I did not realize um, when I was in your shoes was – I, I underestimated the value of the activities that you do outside of school. Um, so being in your position, yes, the grades are good, the GPA number is important, but knowing the, the limited experience that you will have from a professional perspective, I'm interested in knowing more about you. So knowing if you're in some student body organization, um, any type of athletic program, anything you're doing in your church or community, that really helps me to understand who you are as a person. Um, the, I tell people, and I'm not speaking for the panel here, but maybe just speaking for myself, the GPA will get you the interview, but the person will get you the job. So I want to know, am I able to work with you? Can my team work with you? Are you willing? Can, can you accept the mistakes that you make, learn from them? Um, and can you grow realizing the opportunities um, in, in some weak areas um, for yourself? So having that insight into some of the extracurricular activities that you do outside of just school goes a long way um, for me when it comes to recruiting for internships and permanent positions. So something to keep in mind. Don't underestimate the value in that when you uh, have your, your resumes put together. So... <clears throat> I'm very old. I didn't get my bachelor's degree till I was over 40. So um, if I, if what I wish I had known then when I was young and went to college the first time was to finish what I started. And because while I have had an amazing career, um, it could have, I really wonder about what it could have been, you know, um, and different opportunities that I didn't have because I didn't have my degrees sooner. So um, finish what you start. You guys are all in the right place for that and see it through. When we're, um, when we're doing interviewing, you're right. It's the person that gets the job. And part, of what I, part of what your college degree tells me, other than your GPA, is that you can see something through from start to finish. 
and I want to know that you can what I give you to finish you can you're willing to tackle it and do that um, you know things and you're right the other curricular activities see somebody that's an Eagle Scout that's a heck of a, an achievement it tells me that you have the stick to itiveness to see something through so that's what I that's what I wish I had done um, something I wish I would have done. Um, so when I first started my CPA, I was also very interested in work. So then I was, I kept trying to put it off and you only get busier as you go higher in your company and same scenario, um, finish what you start. Um, it's hard and that w I, there's always good reasons to stop because it's hard, you know, work might be easier, social life, anything else can get on the way. So I just stay the right path that you want to go. Uh, it's going to be hard. That's the purpose of it. It's supposed to be hard. Um, so just go for any certification, any school degree, master's that you want to do. Um, and also specific for accounting, I wish uh, I've known that um, you do a lot of writing. You would think that accounting is just numbers, but it's all about writing, translating those numbers into actually explaining to somebody in writing what you're doing. So any class that you have at school, I think they're all equally important. So don't take any of those for granted. <laughs> uh, in addition to all of this, all great wisdom, sage advice, um, I think, and again, you're showing the leadership by being here, but it's using the career services, using the alumni association. Once you become alum, there's 170,000 folks that have gone before you that is a great networking opportunity. You can connect with them through LinkedIn. So it's really, as mentioned earlier today, in a couple different ways, is using the network of Mason Patriots, using the alums, talking to those that have gone before you. Uh, maybe a couple of other things um, is I, and I don't know if I've always told my own children this, but it's really I think chasing your the passion as opposed to maybe money. Um, uh, you really need to do something. It's hard early on, but you need to do something that you love. And if you really love and are passionate about it, you're going to do a better job, and that will lead to better opportunities. Some folks start looking at money and benefits, and that's important. It clearly is. You have to pay the bills. Uh, but there needs to be that nexus between the two, um, and that's something that I think is critically important that not a lot of folks look at coming out of college because they're trying to make money right away. Thank you. And about that money, coming into the government, you're probably not going to make as much money um, starting off as your peers, um, but just give yourself a little time, and you might very well pass them pretty quickly. Um, luckily, I had a father who was in the government who helped me a lot through college, I would say some of the things he told me um, for you all is uh, your communication ability, whether it's writing or speaking, you're definitely going to have to know how to do it and do it well. Um, your interpersonal relationships, if you can get along with people, you're going to be able to, to move up in your career. Um, it, it's, everything is about relationships wherever you are. So um, that's very important. Your motivation level your reputation and your confidence. So obviously every single one of you here are motivated because you're here today. Um, confidence, I'm not talking about arrogance, I'm just talking about confidence. And that means say something with the thought that you know what you're talking about. I told an intern that I had recently, she was very smart, but she always qualified her sentences with, well, I'm only an intern, or well, I'm not quite sure because no. No, don't do that. Tell me what you want to say and be confident about it. And I can see I can see confidence in your eyes when I look at you in an interview, when we're talking about a project. I can see it, and, it, and it's energizing to see someone who has that confidence. Um, your reputation. Your reputation will make you or break you. Not saying that you can't get a second chance because we are a nation of second chances, but your reputation takes you quite far. And whether it's starting the job, people hear about you or during your career and the work ethic that you apply, your reputation will take you far. Yeah, and I, I, all this advice has been great. And I think for me, the biggest thing is networking. And I commend all of you guys for being here today because you're ahead of your peers. Just by being here, listening to this advice, networking, building those bridges, um, almost every single job I've gotten is because I knew someone who made a connection for me. They said, hey, I want to introduce you to so-and-so. 
Um, and my dad gave me a piece of advice that I did not take in college that I wish I had. And it was um, ask people out for lunch or coffee. If you see someone who's doing what you want to do, say, hey, can I take you out to lunch? Can I take you out to coffee? And especially if you're willing to pay, most people will say yes. They'll make time in their schedule. And honestly, like you never know, that $5 cof coffee or lunch, whatever, that could get you a job. So use that. Like say, Whether it's a professor, whether it's someone in a career that you want to um, pursue, just saying, hey, can I, can I take you out to lunch? Um, and sometimes even you'll take them out to lunch and say, I'll buy, and then they'll pay for it. And then it's like, cool, I got a free lunch. <laughs> um, and then you, you get a free, and then follow up with them, write them an email, say thank you. Um, because you never know what doors that's going to open. And that could lead to a great career just because you know someone who says, oh, let me introduce you, let me send your resume on. Um, it's a huge thing. And so, and I, I work at an association that does that. We help build bridges, and it's vitally important. So that's what I'd tell you guys. Stay here, okay. They'll come out. 